Hello and welcome to the Bible study. Tonight is the third message of a nine-week series on Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And tonight's message is part three called Jesus as the Way. And this message is focusing on the only way to walk. So the first message was the only way to the Father. The second message was the only way to talk. And this week, it's the only way to walk. This is an awesome study because we're going to take a close look at how Jesus lived out his life in a few different examples from Scripture, but it also an overall broad stroke of who he was. And the idea is that as we study Jesus more in how he behaved, how he spoke, how he thought, who he is, why it matters, <clears throat> the hope is that we would then be more like him or, or at least choose that. And if we can at least choose to be more like him, maybe, just maybe, we might act more like him. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, please be here present in this study tonight, God. I ask that you would bless all of us with a message, God. Put forth whatever you want us to hear, whatever you want us, me to say, Lord. Have it come out and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Excited to be here with you. Part three, the only way to walk. We're going to be taking a close look at two sections from the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at chapter four, the first 11 verses, which is the temptation of Jesus in the desert or the wilderness as it's often called, but it was desert. And Matthew 26, verses 36 through 50, we're going to be looking at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was about to be betrayed and turned over eventually to the Romans, uh, Romans, <laughs> the Romans to be crucified. Um, so we're kind of looking at the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry. And we're going to tie that together to see who Jesus is and how he behaved from start to finish. So that being said, let's pick up our Bibles, the source of truth and head over to Matthew. You might have guessed it, but we're going to pick up in chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he, <clears throat> excuse me, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and angels came and began to serve him. This was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He had been baptized by John. And then immediately after that baptism, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness for the specific purpose of being tempted. So this was all very intentional. And Jesus, after fasting 40 days, was physically in need of food. Because remember, Jesus is fully man, or was at that time. And he was also fully God. This is so crucial, because if Jesus was not fully man, then he wouldn't be um, <clears throat> the proper atonement to be able to take the penalty for our sin as humans. But if he weren't fully God, then he wouldn't be perfect and sinless and be the lamb without blemish 
that could then take the atonement for the sin of the world. And that's why it's crucial that we have our theology straight and we know who Jesus is. Jesus is the one and only God who came into the world in the flesh and personified God on earth and showed us how to live our lives and then died on the cross for us. Amazing. That's the God we serve. But listen, God led himself into the wilderness and then recorded it in the canon of scripture in order to show us what to do. I want to tell you something here. Jesus responded to the, all three of the devil's um, tactics with scripture. We talked about this briefly last week. The important point here is that not only did Jesus um, refer back to scripture when confronted with that type of uh, behavior from the enemy, not only did he refer to scripture, but he obeyed it. And that's the, that's the important part that I wanted to talk about with you tonight. He obeyed what, what was written. He said, it is written. And he went back to Deuteronomy, actually, three times. All three of Jesus' responses to the, uh, to the devil's temptings were from the book of Deuteronomy. Listen, whenever Jesus says, verily, verily, I tell you, or truly, truly, I tell you, or listen to me, or anything where he's saying something to catch our attention first, really, really pay attention, right? That's God telling you, truly, truly, I tell you. Well, when Jesus is taking three things from one book in one moment, in one breath, essentially, to combat the attacks of the enemy, we might do well to treat that as one of those verily, verily moments and say, well, what's, what's Deuteronomy all about? Why, does that, why is he quoting Deuteronomy? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you why. Well, really, I can't speak for Jesus, but I'll tell you some observations. Deuteronomy literally means the second law or repetition of the law. And essentially, Deuteronomy written by Moses, was spoken, um, was Moses speaking and reiterating the law that God told him, that he wrote down. He's speaking and reiterating to this next generation of Israelites, to the second generation that came out of Egypt. So all of the rest of the first generation did not get to enter the promised land because of their um, lack of faith in this promised land that God had given them. Only two guys, Joshua and Caleb, you know, Moses sent out 12 guys and said, hey, go give me a report on this land when they were escaping Egypt and they got to the promised land. And everybody, 10 out of 12 rather, said, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, but it's scary and there's big tall giants and they have a lot of weapons and, you know, we're afraid and we shouldn't go there. We shouldn't do that. We can't conquer them. <clears throat> Caleb and Joshua were like, what are you talking about? The land is ripe. It's flowing with milk and honey. That's our land. Let's take our land. God said it's our land. He promised it all the way back from Abraham. That's ours. Centuries before that, that's our land. Well, <clears throat> long story short, Caleb and Joshua, because of their faith, were the only two from that generation who were able to enter into the promised land. But this new younger generation that had been born in the wilderness for 40 years, they had been wandering in the wilderness because of that faithlessness. So you have 40 years of children being born. That is the second generation of Israelites coming out of Egypt. That generation, in order to not forget God, Moses reiterated the law. Deuteronomy, he repeated the law of God. And in this time, <clears throat> that is what Deuteronomy is all about. So it's a revival back to scripture. It's a turning towards scripture for the answers in life. Jesus, being tempted by the devil, quoted three passages from a moment in time back in recorded in scripture when there was a revival back toward the word of God. How does that speak to us today? Look at all of the things in, in uh, all, of the, all of the reformist movements, at least since the 1500s. But if you know some church history, which I've been blessed enough to learn a little bit recently, <clears throat> 
if you look at all these all these men and women who tried to come against the oppression and the um, the misuse of the word of God and the holding back of the word of God from anyone to be able to read, as you look at all these things, you you realize that uh, sola scriptura, right? Only scripture, biblical Christianity is the way. That is the way that Jesus talked about when he said, I am the way. There is one way and it's Jesus and he's the living word. So the word of God, scripture, is the only place that we should go to handle anything in life, anything that comes comes our way. We search scripture and then we communicate with each other and we use the, the minds that God gave us, M-I-N-D-S, the minds. We communicate, we listen to pastors, we preach if that's what we're called to, we teach and we learn together. But the key I'm talking about is that reform is not over. Reform is not a movement that ended and now everything's great. No, we need to return back to scripture. That's what we need. Anything extra biblical, not scripturally based, is not appropriate to be called in the name of Christ. It's not real. It's man's fabrication and it's very dangerous because we turn many people away. Listen, back in Deuteronomy, when, when Moses was reading to the people, this second generation, there was a transfer of leadership. Moses had been leading the people for 40 years from, from Egypt. And in this moment, before he came down and repeated the law, starting in chapter 4, in chapter 3 of Deuteronomy, we see a transfer of leadership from Moses to Joshua. Joshua was his right-hand man. He stayed up on the mountain with, with Moses. He was near him at the tent of gathering. Like J- Joshua was always there, and he was faithful when they gave a report on the land 40 years earlier, on the land of milk and honey. So Joshua, they laid hands on him, Moses and Aaron and all that, and they gave, uh, they transferred ownership, uh, leadership rather, to him. Interesting point. Fast forward to Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. There's a transfer of leadership in that moment as well because the leadership was given to me and you back in the Garden of Eden when God told Adam, the very first person he created, that Adam, you are to protect and to keep the land. You will till the ground from which you came. We were called to protect God's creation. And when he made Eve, formed from Adam's, rib he made us as a companion to companionship together to become one flesh to do his kingdom work that's what god instituted but when we sinned in that original garden of eden when eve ate the fruit that we were commanded not to eat and then adam followed suit we handed over the keys to satan so the leadership transferred from us to satan it still falls under the umbrella of us. Our failed leadership is the system we live under right now. 2022, it's May 4th. That system of our failed leadership from the Garden of Eden is where we reside, which means Satan has taken the reins because we gave them to him when we ate the fruit. But Jesus, he came on the scene and there was a transfer of leadership from Satan or us fallen to him, to Jesus. And Jesus came to make that known. And he died on the cross and overcame death. He rose from the grave, uh, or he died on the cross and overcame sin. He rose from the grave three days later and overcame death. And he's going to conquer Satan in the last day. And Satan is going to go to hell forever. There's a transfer of leadership to the true and living God, and we get to serve with him. So we become co-heirs. We become priests, high priests, and royalty with God when we are in the family of God. This is all pretty awesome. But putting that back to Jesus, the only way to walk, the only way to walk. Jesus referred back to Deuteronomy three times. The first time it was because of that physical need. 
Jesus said, no, it is, it is uh, written that man does not eat by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's referring back to the time when Moses was saying, hey, remember when we were in the wilderness, God provided manna for us. We didn't have food and God provided everything we needed. And he's saying we didn't just need that food. We needed the voice of God. We needed the voice of God in our ears. So Jesus is referring back to that moment. You follow where I'm going with this? The people were very confused at that time. And Moses was doing his best, pulling his hair out, trying to lead these guys. And Jesus is referring back to that, saying, remember what they were to remember, that God is in command and that we are called to read the word of God, listen to God and obey. Listen, the second time when Satan attacks Jesus saying, if you are the son of God, right? He's goading his pride and he quotes scripture. Satan quotes Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is a section of scripture that many people who I do believe are saved by faith. I do believe that many of these people who who rely on this set of uh, portion of scripture are saved, but they will rely on this and say health, wealth, and prosperity, and nothing can harm us. And I believe that that's taken out of context, and it's taken inappropriately to say that God will never allow us to get harmed or be sick. And that's just denial. That's just denial. God is a miracle worker and God can heal. But if you look through the Bible, you will see over and over examples of people who knew God could, but didn't say that he had to. Job. God allowed him to get that sick. It was a test of faith in the end. And he he returned everything double fold. But he was in a terrible place of anguish. Um, Hezekiah. Hezekiah got sick. He cried out to the Lord. The Lord added 15 years to his life. Jesus himself said, don't test the Lord your God. That was his response. He didn't say, yeah, you're right. Let me just go ahead and do this and jump off. No one's going to hurt me. God himself in the flesh said, don't test the Lord. Now he's referring back to when Moses was reminding the people out of Egypt saying, remember when you complained and groaned about not having water, God provided water for us. But that place became known as the place of testing When the people cried out and said, God, where are you? Where are you? You're not here. Well, that was faithlessness. Do you see the common theme? It's faith. The common theme is faith, but faith is acted out. Faith is proven by action. Jesus acted upon faith. He did not eat and turn the rocks into bread and eat them. He said, no, live by the word of God, not just food, even though he was 40 days and 40 nights famished. Satan goaded his pride and said, I know you won't get hurt. And Jesus said, no, don't test God. There's a humility there. The last time he quoted Deuteronomy 6.13, when Satan said, okay, worship me then. And Jesus went back to Deuteronomy and said, um, Only to worship the Lord your God. What exactly did he say? Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now in that section of Deuteronomy, he's referring back to when the people in the wilderness wanted any other gods. And he's referring back saying, no, there is one God. One of my favorite scriptures is Deuteronomy 4.39. Moses is telling the people, he says, no today. K-N-O-W, no, consider, right? No today and consider it in your heart that there is one God in heaven above and on earth below. He talks about one God and he says, consider this in your heart and know this. That was Deuteronomy. That's when he was repeating the law of God. Said all that to say this. From the beginning of Jesus's ministry, he walked in obedience He walked in obedience throughout the course of his life. Take a breath and move through and would take a broad stroke of his life. He served. He taught. He led people. He discipled. 
He walked with integrity always. He acted with love for others. All the times he said he was compassionate for for people. All the times he healed, he taught, he preached, he was acting with love. Even correcting the false religious teachers, he was still acting from a place of love because he was trying to course correct them to heaven instead of hell. You know that song, Highway to Hell? Yeah, there's a highway to hell. It's like a 50 lane freeway going one direction. That is not the road we want to be on. We want to be on the narrow path heading the other direction that few will find because it's difficult, but it leads to life. Jesus walked with humility. Look at all the things he said. When he said, come to me, you are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest for your souls. He says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. My yoke is not heavy. My burden is not heavy. I'm gentle. I'm lowly at heart. I will teach you. My burden is not too heavy. He said, come to me no matter where you are in your life, no matter whether you believe in God or not. He says, come to me. Even even though you're an enemy of me, I love you anyway so much that I want to show you that I am the way. That's what Jesus said. He wants to show us. Listen, Jesus did what was right for the right reason, even when it wasn't popular. Case in point, on a Sabbath, when the Pharisees, these religious leaders, they were trying to catch Jesus in the act of doing something against the law, right? The law of Moses. But the problem with this is that the Pharisees, these religious leaders who knew scripture better than anybody besides the Sadducees, who were the scribes, they had gotten caught up in the tradition rather than the purpose. Sounds a lot like today. When you look at Roman Catholicism, when you look at Orthodox, when you look at All of these denominations, it's like we got caught up in the tradition rather than the purpose. And the purpose, the purpose is love. The purpose is to love others while we're here. And loving others, one of the things that proves our love for others is pointing them towards the message of the gospel where Jesus died on the cross. That's a loving thing to tell somebody about that. But then when he was in on the Sabbath day, he wanted to heal a guy who had a crippled hand. And they were like, are you going to do that? That's a work. And we're not supposed to do any works on the Sabbath. And Jesus was like, would you rather he just stay that way? He healed him. And they hated him for it. They started plotting ways to, to kill him because they were caught up in the tradition rather than the purpose. And so Jesus did what was right for the right reasons, even when it wasn't popular. He lived under the authority of the Father. Look at the, look at the Gospels. Jesus always followed what the Father said. He said it to us several times. Yeah, buddy? Hang, hang on one second. I'm almost done. I've got maybe five minutes. I still Ten want, minutes. Maybe I want. I want it quickly. I'm I'm on live right now. What? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Live. I'm on right now. What's live? Facebook Live. Can I? Can you give me ten minutes? Five minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. Seven minutes. Okay. All right. Seven minutes. Can you close the door behind you, buddy? Okay. Thank you. Seven minutes. I also got your cards. Thank you. Boy, negotiating with a six-year-old is harder than I thought. My goodness. Jesus told us he didn't tell us anything that didn't come from the Father. He said he always acted upon the Father, the will of the Father. And I'm going to prove that in a minute. But also, he was intentional. Jesus was always intentional. He had a strong intent and intention in all the things he said and did. He didn't just putz around and knock stuff over in his life. When he spoke, he had a purpose and a meaning. When he did something, he had a purpose and a meaning. And when he didn't have something to say or do, he was pretty much praying. That's Jesus. That's who he was. Can we spend every waking minute praying if we're not talking or doing something? Not likely. 
But can we devote a little time, right? Can we devote a little more time the next day? Can we devote at least some sort of practice of it to spend a little time in prayer, to try to listen and hear from God and hear from the Father? I don't hear voices telling me, you know, God said this, God said that. I, I'm not saying one way or the other whether anyone can can have that experience. I, I don't know. I know that for me, God speaks to me when I read the word because he'll remind me. As I'm reading something, he'll remind me of another scripture or something will become revealed that impacts me. I'll have an understanding or a feeling about <clears throat> something and I'll want to research it further. And then all of a sudden, all these scriptures are popping up. That's the Holy Spirit in action. He said he would remind me of the things Jesus said and did. Well, sure enough, he comes through. Holy Spirit comes through. All of that being said about Jesus, let's go back to when I said he lived under the authority of the Father. And I said, I'm going to prove that in just a moment. I want to talk to you briefly about the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus had finished with the, uh, the Last Supper, as it's commonly called. And he was with the disciples, and they were heading out through the, the um, <clears throat> Mount of Olives. And they got to the Garden of Gethsemane. At this time, Judas was about to betray Jesus. And right before he did, Jesus had a few moments of, of prayer. And I want to look at this together quickly because the impact of this is very special. If you have had moments in your life where you've ever doubted, right? Which, come on, who hasn't? Who hasn't had a moment where you've really had a doubt about something related to God or to your, your walk with Christ? I mean, it's just unreasonable to say that you've never had questions. But if we refer back to scripture, let's look at what Jesus did right here. Jesus had about a three and a half year ministry on earth from that baptism until right now, the baptism I spoke about earlier. So from that tempting in the garden, I mean that temptation in the desert to this moment in the garden was about three and a half years. <clears throat> he knew and prophesied several times that he was going to die on the cross and that he was going to be beaten and marred to the point where you couldn't even tell he was a man. That's how badly his face was going to be pulped. It's disgusting, I know, but that's the reality. That's what he did. But, you know, that physical, you know, uh, suffering that he took, putting that aside of on, on its own, what it already is, the unbearable thought of what he went through, putting that aside and focusing on him as a human being, knowing this is about to happen, knowing what he's about to face and having known it his whole life. But now he's moments away from the beginning of this um, crucifixion day, right? This whole process that's about to be, you know, just un, uh, unbearable. Verse 36, Matthew chapter 26. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the other two sons of Deb Zebedee, which is John and James, his top three guys, Peter, John, and James, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. As a matter of fact, the book of Luke says towards the end of this moment in the garden, he's praying fervently and drops of blood are like sweating from him. He's sweating blood. He's in agony. He even says, I'm in agony to the point of death. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Man, his heart was racing and he was going through it. And he says, going a little farther, he, uh, a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus himself, faced with the prospect of saving humanity forever, with the unbearable atrocity in, that he was about to endure, he said, God, is there another way? Father, is there any other way? And in the same breath and in the same moment, he said, but nevertheless, your will and not mine. The human nature of Jesus did not want to face the suffering, but in submission to the Father, the authority of the Father, he allowed God to reign in his life. And it led him to save me and you. He was under the authority of the Father, now, if you go on to read that, Jesus prays two other times 
three times within maybe a half an hour, who knows how long, but a very short period of time, three times Jesus prays, is there any other way? Can you take this cup of suffering from me? But nevertheless, your will and not mine be done. That's Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate example of obedience. Obedience to the Father. And how do we know the Father? He revealed himself through scripture. He revealed himself through the life of Jesus. He revealed himself through the act of love and dying on the cross for us. We know the Father. Thomas said, God, we don't, or Jesus, we don't know the way. And Jesus said, you do know the way. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And none come to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. So join us next week as we go through the truth. These first three studies were the way. Now we're going to go to the truth. We're going to talk about, over the next three studies, the integrity of the word. We're going to talk about the purity, right, of Jesus. We're going to talk about, um, I forgot the other, the third one, but we're going to have three great studies on how Jesus is truth. So join us. It's going to be awesome. Wednesdays at 7 p.m., Keep that date flexible, that day and uh, week. I might be getting a new job soon, so I may have to be flexible on Wednesday or not, but that's totally fine because there's never really too many people live with me, but I know you watch it later, so I appreciate um, that you would appreciate. I may not be Wednesdays at 7 every time, but I'll do my best to stick to that. For consistency's sake, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this enriching study. Um, I feel very encouraged, God. I want to live like you. God, help me to live in humility and uh, do the right thing for the right reason, even and especially when no one's looking, and especially if it's not popular, God. Let me live upright, regardless of what anybody says around me, regardless of how much they don't like me because I choose to do what's right, God. Let that be. Let that be what it is, and let me not be troubled. But instead, let me be a vessel to teach and tell somebody about the true love found within you, God. I pray that for all of us. And thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Be well. I'll see you next week.